do the stories of survivors inform your work? I listen to uh, the stories of uh, hurt uh, and harm and trauma uh, from people from all over the world because you cannot uh, do anything in the area of safeguarding if you don't listen uh, to, to survivors. Mm -hmm. My name is Father Hans Zollner. I'm a Jesuit from Germany. I am the president of the Center for Child Protection of the Gregorian University in Rome, and I'm a member of the Pontifical Commission for the Protection of Minors. Father Zollner, what do you offer at the Center for Child Protection? The Center for Child Protection of the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome uh, offers uh, three things. One, uh, a blended learning and e-learning program for the prevention of abuse uh, offered through an uh, internet-based learning platform uh, in all continents and at the moment in six languages. Uh, we offer this program to universities, uh, to faculties or seminaries that are interested to have that kind of uh, information and course in built into their curricula into their study programs. Mm -hmm. Secondly, we offer residential programs in Rome in English, a one semester so-called diploma course and a two years full-fledged master's course in safeguarding uh, in uh, an interdisciplinary way addressing legal questions, psychological, psychiatric, sociological and theological questions. And the fourth one is uh, research. We have a number of doctoral PhD students who endeavor into uh, areas of uh, knowledge and research that where we don't have much or nothing um, until now, like uh, sexual uh, violence uh, committed uh, within certain cultures uh, and how they deal with this, for example, in Africa or in Asia. So these are the things that the Center for Child Protection offers. Um, to uh, a student body uh, that um, basically covers the whole world. How do the stories of survivors inform your work? Very much so, because I'm in constant contact with survivors. Some of them write to me daily. Um, I listen to uh, the stories of uh, hurt uh, and harm and trauma uh, from people from all over the world in different languages, from different, very different contexts and situations. And this uh, is centerpiece to our work at the Center for Child Protection because you cannot uh, do anything in the area of safeguarding if you don't listen uh, to, to survivors. Mm -hmm. A lot of survivors that we've spoken with um, are, are still very understandably angry, righteously angry. Um, and I, I wonder how you, in a sense, minister or, or offer a pastoral response to survivors who are angry that the church is not moving at um, the speed at which many people would like to see it moving. You know, how do you console and counsel, how do you console survivors um, in that anger and frustration? Yeah, I don't pretend to console them. Uh, I, what I can offer is that I listen uh, to them, that I share my my time, my my presence, my understanding, my empathy with them as much as possible, and that I share with them also my own concerns. Uh, yesterday I met here in uh, New York uh, somebody who told me uh, very clearly that he's very much enraged with the church, and so what can I do? I, I am there, uh, I take it on, and, and I... I try to listen uh, to all levels of such uh, such an expression. So at the recent Vatican summit, Pope Francis did promise some concrete measures and guidelines. And um, I think many of us are, are still waiting for those. Um, do you have a sense of what those guidelines will look like and when we can expect to see those measures? Now, a few of them have been announced already at the end of the conference by Father Lombardi. One uh, set of guidelines concerns the uh, city of the Vatican State. Uh, so the, uh, the Vatican uh, itself, which is uh, the smallest country in the world, but uh, it would be of highest symbolic value that we get a clear um, 
a set of laws, uh, for example, also on reporting of uh, allegations or suspicion of abuse, uh, as well as guidelines for uh, dealing, for example, also with the educational piece within the the state of the Vatican City. Mm-hmm. So, we, if we, if someone wanted to, they could look up and find out what are the reforms that will be applied now to the Vatican City. To the Vatican City, and they are as far as I understand, about to be published. They they told us a few days ago that uh, it is all almost ready and I think it, it will be out very soon from now. Mm-hmm. Uh, another um, guideline, if you wish, uh, was announced um, and that was called a vade mecum, which would be the publication of uh, rules of uh, jurisprudence. Um, so what has been the common practice in dealing with this kind of allegation, with this kind of case? Uh, and and that would give uh, certainly not only an instruction to the bishops and the, to the provincials or superior generals of religious congregations of how we can deal with um, this specific set uh, of offenses, but it would also give uh, an indication to to canon lawyers how to deal with a certain kind of offense. And this would be something that could be used worldwide? Exactly. It is meant to be uh, published worldwide. And one reason why it is still not out uh, is that it needs to be translated in different languages. And uh, translation of such a legal text is uh, a very time-consuming effort. Mm-hmm. What are some other reforms that we've heard of emerging from the Vatican summit? Now, I myself have proposed the establishment of so-called task forces uh, that would uh, go out uh, and help especially those bishops' conferences, uh, and they are quite a number, that don't have guidelines yet. Um, they don't have f- at least full-fledged approved Uh, and revised guidelines, uh, how to deal with uh, abuse, how to uh, approach uh, victims, what to do with perpetrators, how to um, set up safeguarding programs and how to establish um, the cooperation with civil authorities. Mm -hmm. A good number of bishops' conferences unfortunately don't have those guidelines yet for a variety of reasons. Um, Most of them don't have the resources, they don't have the competent personnel because they are small uh, or they are in in countries where uh, you don't have uh, that trained um, persons that could help you to spell out this. Mm -hmm. So the task forces would uh, especially target those bishops' conferences, offer the help in drafting guidelines, in uh, implementing them, and giving a report, of course, to the bishops' conference, of course, to the respective offices in the Holy See, and... Uh, would come up with a plan of what are the next steps so that we can, uh, first of all, establish a common standard for the whole global Catholic Church in 190 or plus countries uh, for 1.3 billion Catholics. Mm-hmm. Uh, and how could we uh, really come uh, to raise the standard one step after the other? Mm-hmm. So you mentioned the, the Vatam may come before. Did I say that right? Yeah. Okay. So you mentioned the Vatimecum before as a general set of of rules of jurisprudence or these guidelines that could be used internationally. And then you've also recommended, uh, you personally have recommended the task force that uh, could help uh, dioceses around the world implement. Would it be the implementation of the Vatimecum or would it be a different set of guidelines that would be local to that region? Now, the Vatimecum, as far as I understand, would be a really, um, let me say, uh, focus on the law aspect. The law aspect is important, but uh, the guidelines, as at least as the Holy See, the Congregation for Doctrine, uh, asked for in 2011, uh, include many other areas that are not specifically uh, uh, legislated by norms or, or regulations. Mm-hmm. Like prevention. Exactly. The educational piece, the, 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 the element of how do you approach and, uh, and how do you receive uh, victims' voices. Mm-hmm. Yeah? So all this uh, is broader in guidelines uh, rather than in norms. Great.